morning. Thank you for coming to Rocky Mountain Church. Uh, I know that uh, getting to church, coming to church uh, can be a sacrifice and can be something that takes a good amount of effort. And so thank you uh, for, for being here. We are uh, almost done. We've got two more Sundays in the book of Proverbs. This morning, we are talking about the reality of friendship. Uh, What should we be looking for in our friends? Uh, What are some of the maybe red flags in relationships that we should be aware of? But I'd like to convince you of, of one thing, and probably most importantly, you were created for relationships. You were made for friends. You were made for close, deep relationships, not many, but maybe two, maybe three, people that you call friends. Uh, Over the years, I'd say 15 or so years, there's been a good amount of studies done on the side effects of loneliness in America. Uh, I think that we could all agree that we have experienced seasons of loneliness in our own lives. I know I have. I'm sure that you have as well. And then there was a striking survey that came out, um, and BYU, the college, did this survey of 3.5 million people over 35 years, and BYU determined that loneliness matched smoking as a long-term risk factor, with the equivalent side effects of smoking 15 cigarettes a day. 3.5 million people over 35 years found that 32% were more likely to die because of loneliness than smoking cigarettes. Uh, This has become probably very striking for all of us and witnessed throughout the COVID era where we were on lockdown, separated, unwilling, maybe sometimes to even have a face-to-face conversation with someone. But it doesn't negate the fact that when we look at God's design being created in the image of him, image of God, the triune God, that you were made for friends. And if that's true, then what type of people should you and I be looking for? What characteristics define what a good friend looks like? Uh, Once again, I believe that the wisdom found in the book of Proverbs can speak into this very area of our lives and helps us answer a few challenging questions when it comes to the reality of friendship. Uh, You and I were made for relationship. Uh, if, If you look at King Solomon's life and often found himself penning Proverbs, but also wrote a book called Ecclesiastes, very similar in some regard to how do we live wisely? What, what, is, what does life look like? What are the disappointing things in life? What are the things we should find joy in? In Ecclesiastes 4, 9 through 12, it might be uh, familiar to you, but it's, but it's a passage that's often taken out of context when dealing with relationships. And I want to convince you of one thing, that relationships in your life are vital for daily survival. I want to take you to Ecclesiastes quickly. Chapter 4, verse 9, kind of set the tone for us this morning. It says this, two are better than one because they have a good reward for their toil or their labor. For if they fall, one will lift up his fellow. But woe to him who is alone when he falls and has another to lift him up. Again, if two lie together, they keep warm. But how can one keep warm alone? And though a man might prevail against one who is alone, two will withstand him. A threefold cord is not quickly broken. It would seem that King Solomon understood that friendships, like I said, were vital not just for having joy in life, not just for getting along and making the best of life, but they were vital to survival. (laughs) Getting taken out of a pit, (laughs) getting pulled along when you feel a full weight. And, And this is echoed in the garden narrative in Genesis 2, where God looked at Adam and he said, hey, this is a good thing. All of creation is good. I created it. I find it lovely. I find it good. But there seems to be an issue. And the issue was it's not good for man to be alone. So the solution is I will make him a helper. And a helper that is actually fit for him. 
It goes just beyond this issue of, of masculinity and femininity. It goes into this whole arena of relationships and why we need them. You and I were made to be given relationships that are fitting for us. It's God's design in which he gifts us with those in our lives. Think about that. The deepest relationships that you have, the friendships that you have are a gift. I don't deserve them. You don't deserve them. But they've been provided to you, given to you. Uh, One of the most... Thing, uh, things that I enjoy about C.S. Lewis is his ability to understand and articulate the importance of friendships. And he had five or six of them that were very deep. He valued it so much that he was convinced it was a gift from God. In his classic work, The Four Loves, he writes this, Christ who said to the disciples, you have not chosen me, but I have chosen you can truly say to every group of Christian friends, you have not chosen one another, but I have chosen you for one another. He goes on to to end the, the chapter by saying this, friendship is the greatest of worldly goods. Certainly to me, it is the chief happiness of life. Author Drew Hunter talks about this reality when he looks at the culture we face. We're experiencing a friendship famine in our day. As individualism increases, social bonds decrease and we replace flesh and blood relationships with digital illusions of the same. Studies show that Americans have fewer and fewer close friends. Here's the catch. Many people don't feel lonely. But when they stop to think about the depth of their relationships, they often realize that they are more isolated than what they thought. I want to plead with you to live the rest of your dailies, the rest of your days rightly valuing this gift of true friendship. So as we look to the book of Proverbs, we're wrestling with two questions. Two questions when we think about friends. What, what, what should we be looking for? What are the dangers? And Proverbs brings us to helping answer question one. What type of friend should you and I be looking for? What should we be looking for in in a relationship? And, And then secondly, what type of people, friends, are potentially dangerous for you? The Bible talks just as much about, hey, be careful. Use wisdom. Don't surround yourself with certain types of people. There's a reason why God's word tells us those things. I think the book of Proverbs gives us three realities, characteristics of what we should look for in a friend. First is this, dependable. Proverbs 17, 17 says this, a friend loves at all times and a brother is born for adversity. Think about that for a second. A good friend is designed, is given, is blessed for your adversity. He or she is a gift to you from God to help carry the load of the challenges in your life. So one of the main reasons to pursue deep, lasting relationships is the need for you to have someone who's in tune with the hard things that you're facing. Dependable. Dependence in this way is invaluable. Do you have one of those? Proverbs goes on to say in chapter 19, verse 22, what is desired in a man is steadfast love and a poor man is better than a liar. Think about that. This idea of steadfast love is a mix of dependability and loyalty I think we could all agree that we would rather have a friend who is there for us than someone who just shows up when it benefits him or her. You might have some of those relationships. They're convenient. They're nice. They're nice to have a cordial relationship like that, but they're not dependable all the time. They're not trustworthy all the time. They're not loyal all the time. Proverbs 20, verse 6 riffs off of this idea. Many a man proclaims his own steadfast love. Many people will tell you, I love you. I think you're great. 
It's so nice knowing you, but a faithful man who can find. And in the context of that passage, it's talking about faithfulness in relationship. It's talking about someone who's loyal, who's willing to put their life on the line relationally for you. Uh, one, one of the, the pictures that I got as I thought through how do we unpack this idea of dependence and loyal, uh, I'm taken to Luke chapter 5 where Jesus is, is growing in popularity, he's preaching, he finds himself at somebody's home teaching. And there are people gathered in the streets, they know Jesus is there, they've heard he's going to be there, so they're flocking towards him because they want uh, an arena with him, they want to hear him. And uh, there was a group of friends, four of which, who heard Jesus was going to be there. They were friends with a guy who was paralyzed. And do you remember the narrative? What they do with the guy? They put him on a mat, and they, the four guys, walk, walk him to the house. They get there. They realize there's no way we can go through the front door, so what are we going to do? What seems reasonable? Let's cut a hole in the roof. So they, they think about this. They take a guy. I don't know how they got up on top of the roof, but they got there, everything, bed and all, and they're, they're all up there. And can you imagine the racket? Jesus is teaching, and, and they're cutting a hole in the roof. Now, do they believe Jesus could heal the man, heal their friends? I think so. But it wasn't guaranteed. Loyalty and friendship looks something like this. The men who carried the man to Jesus through the roof cared enough about the paralyzed friend to put their reputations on the line for their friend's benefit, even in the spectacle. Just dr drilling holes and, and taking everything off the roof and lowering this guy down. What if it didn't work? What if, what if the man wasn't healed? At times, good friends might put their own reputations on the line for you. Do you have one of those? Do you have a friend like that? So we look for friends through wisdom's narrative, through the, through the lens of wisdom, some that are dependable. We want dependable friends. We want friends that are loyal. And then Proverbs speaks plentiful about finding friends that provide Counsel, providing good counsel. Proverbs 20, verse 5 says this, The purpose in a man's heart is like deep water. Think about that. Deep water. But a man of understanding will draw it out. There are times in your life where you don't even know what you're feeling. <laughs> what to say, what to think. The intentions of your heart's you're anxious about your future plans. We should look for and appreciate friends who help draw out the deep things in our lives, the deep things in our hearts. And sometimes that's really hard because that friend might look at you and say, you could be off there. Maybe the decision you made wasn't a, wasn't a good one. Or maybe, did you think about this before you did that? Faithful are the wounds of a friend, Proverbs 27, 6 says. Profuse are the kisses of an enemy. Goes on to say in Proverbs 27, 9, oil and perfume make the heart glad and the sweetness of a friend comes from his earnest counsel. And when that counsel is happening, there is a sharpening taking place in Proverbs 27, 17. That ironing, iron sharpen, ironing movement is happening as one man sharpens another. Now, this is hard to stomach, I think, in our culture. This idea of wounds and earnest counsel and sharpening seems like it could be the opposite of a type of friend that I want. Why would I want a friend like that? That seems kind of mean or maybe not appropriate. I mean, shouldn't my friends just empathize with everything that I'm going through? I mean, if they really loved me, wouldn't they just want to be there for me in my pain without questioning where I find myself? 
I want to give you a picture of what a faithful friend looks like when you might not be in the best position to be one yourself. Think about a raging river and a bank. You've got a raging river, whitewater class five on the verge of death, and you find yourself in it relationally, emotionally. You're distraught. You've gone through great pain in your life, and you're floundering in the whitewater. And so you say, help, like any of us would do. The friend on the bank has a choice to make, doesn't he? He can jump all the way into the raging river with you. Because what you're asking is this. I need you, friend. I need you to jump into the river with me. I need you to identify with all my pain. I need you to feel what I feel, know what I know. And you're over here on the bank saying, I've never lost a child. I've never been divorced. I've not recovered from addiction. How can I jump in here if I've never known it myself? But the person here is saying, you have to jump in. And if you don't jump in, you don't love me. That's a cultural narrative right now that is rampant in our world. And and it's the opposite of Hebrews 10.24 that says this, and let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works so that you can actually reach out and say, I love you, let me help you. I can't lose myself I got to stay grounded into who God is and who I am. I want to help you, but I cannot identify with everything you're dealing with. I can't take the weight of that upon my shoulders. And they know that if they lose themselves in trying to rescue you from the raging river, that in the long run, it will not be helpful for either one of you. There are things to consider when looking for a good and faithful friend But we all know the dangers in surrounding ourselves with people who do not have our best interests in mind. And you might think, well, Pastor A.G., isn't that that just hardening? Why wouldn't you jump in there? Why 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 don't you just leave the bank and fully embrace the pain and the issues the other person is facing? Because the danger is this. What happens when you jump in? Who's now drowning? Both of you. It's quicksand. No one's on the bank to say, well, maybe it didn't happen that way. Or or maybe we should take some time and rethink how to approach that relationship or or that broken thing. Maybe, Maybe we should talk to a few more people and get some advice. See, when you jump in here, you don't have any time for that. You don't have emotional equity for that. You're all in the pain. And you both will end up drowning And I think Christians, uh, we struggle with assessing this enough. Because we know this, that sometimes bad company, what does it do? What is it actually asking to do? It's a corruptive thing, it's an eroding thing, and it erodes good character. So Proverbs answers this second question for us, what type of people are dangerous for you? I think there's two things we need to consider. One is this, we should avoid people who are unwilling to forgive. We should avoid people, friendships, who are unwilling to forgive. God's word addresses unforgiveness with serious tone all over scripture. And a heart that is unwilling to forgive is a heart that is disconnected from the gospel. And I'm talking deep friendship here. I'm not talking evangelistic relationship or familial relationship. I'm talking about who are the two to three people, maybe five people max in your life that you can go deep with. One of the characteristics you do not want to associate yourself with are people who are unwilling to, will not, cannot see, will back away from forgiveness every single time. It's not good for your soul. Proverbs 17 tells us just that. Whoever covers an offense seeks love. But who, but he who repeats a matter separates close friends. What's that repeats a matter? What's he saying there? 
unwilling to let it go, using it as a divisive strategic tool to bring separation. And if the cycle of unforgiveness is found in the relationship, it's going to be very hard to count on them to be dependable, to count on them to be loyal. Secondly is this. Dependence on you other than God will ruin your relationship. Dependence on you for every emotional Connection, relational connection, even spiritual connection. If it's apart from them owning their faith, it will end poorly. So I love the Proverbs so much. They speak to the heart of the human being so well because what, what, what happens is this. When we idolize others or we become so codependent on them for everything, we run the danger of them failing us. And what happens when they, he or she, fails you? You can grow bitter, angry, even to the point of hating them because you've put so much weight on them to be God in your life. It is an impossible task for them to bear. They will fail you. They're human beings. It's it's a role they're not supposed to play. I love this proverb in Proverbs 25, 17. It says this, let your foot be seldom in your neighbor's house, lest he have his fill of you and hate you. (laughs) He's not talking about, hey, don't have people over for dinner. What he's talking about is, hey, if, if you or your neighbor think that in your relationship you can play God for one another, there is going to come a place where there is such disappointment and loss in the relationship that it moves to hatred. You're not giving me what I want. And you've become an idol in their lives, and they've become an idol in yours. Good friends have healthy boundaries. And when we don't have those things, this is what Proverbs says is going to happen. Answer not a fool according to his folly, lest you be like him yourself. At times when the temptation is, hey, join me. Join me in all of my pain. You need to believe what I believe. Identify with me in everything. Could it be that that person might not be walking with the Lord? Could could it be, is it possible that maybe they got the facts wrong? Could, Could it be that maybe their understanding of the situation isn't accurate? What happens then when you give into that, you then become like that very person? I'm not saying faithful friends should not ask for help. They should be vulnerable with you and you with them, but they should never demand that you feel what they feel and experience what they have experienced. This is relational manipulation and can lead to some of the very damaging consequences in and outside of the church. So if someone comes up to you in relationship and you're a friend with them and they're talking foolishness, gossip, slander, lies, arrogance, vulgarity, etc., you are not obligated to be their friend. That's okay. You don't have to feel guilty for choosing to hold up a boundary and not give them the attention they're desiring. Especially if it's outside of the bounds of who God is. The Bible actually says this type of behavior can protect you from becoming the fool they are. There's an interesting statement in John 2, 24, about Jesus in his relationship with the people around him. It says this, but Jesus on his part did not entrust himself to them because he knew all people. Now Jesus, being fully God and fully man, yes, he knew the hearts of the human. He created it. But he was fully God and fully man in the flesh, and there were people that he would not associate with. He would distance himself from. I mean, think about the popularity of Jesus as he grew in his teaching, and there were miracles happening. People were coming to him all the time, saying, hey, you should do this, Jesus, or maybe you should think about that, or or, what about this? 
And there were spaces in his own life for him to walk in accordance with the will of God where he had to have some strategic boundaries. And ultimately, biblical boundaries can protect your friendships. And here's why. When you are in a great friendship, you know what's truly freeing? Either one of you do not have to play God. You don't have to do it. There's freedom there. Good things are kept good while not being made ultimate in the relationship. And when you jump into the raging white water, you give up your ability to choose. Unfortunately, it's perceived as unloving when you say, I, I can't, but I'll help. I, I can't, but, but here's some suggestions. I can't, but I, but I love you, and, and I want to see God do a work in your life. I'm with you. Sometimes you're going to be viewed as a bigot, not loving, not understanding. But I want to encourage you, those are faithful boundaries to have in your friendships. About 16 years ago, um, three friends of mine, we kind of made a pact together. Uh, it's two worship pastors and a politician. So what could go wrong, right, when we hang out? Um, and we get together once a year, uh, physically, and we spend time drilling into how our hearts are doing. We all know each other as deep as we can. And throughout the calendar year, we probably talk monthly here and there on the phone, not, maybe not all at one time with everybody, but these are friends that I can trust. These are people that I can walk with. These are men that know me for who I am, and, and they can look me in the eye and say, AJ, could you have understood that poorly? Maybe that wasn't the best decision. And I've grown to love these men and appreciate them. But even in that, even, even if you can't rattle off a couple of names in your head, even if you can't come to terms with the struggle that you have in, in loneliness and relationship, there is one who despite all of our friendship failures and successes, he's acquainted with your loneliness. And in that, you know what he does? He sticks closer than any friend you could ever have. It is one who was lonely, who walked a lonely road, who questioned, if, is there another way? One who his own friends stabbed him in the back sold them out for 30 pieces of silver, claimed they didn't even know him. And yet, in all of that, he called them friends. Proverbs 18 talks about this man. A man of many companions may come to ruin, but there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother in talking about who Jesus is in John 15, greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. There is not one that will be more dependable, more loyal, and more of a faithful counselor than Jesus Christ. And so if you're in that season of loneliness, if, if you're in that season of, I, I've had some friends, but they've, they're gone, I, I'm not around any people at this moment in my life, but, but I want to run to Christ, seek him out. He will not disappoint you. He will not leave you. He will not abandon you. But at the same time, he might ask you, make a phone call. Right? Write a letter. Make it right with that person. Maybe there could be some good fruit that comes from that relationship that you're not, you're not in a place where you believe it yet. So as you look to Christ to ultimately be your all in all in which he calls you a friend, maybe there's some things in our own lives where we can press into and say, you know what? I've been lazy in my relationships, lazy in my friendships. And like C.S. Lewis I hope your friendships bring you great joy because they're gifts. They're gifts given to you. And our, and our big idea is this this morning. Christ is our standard for how we choose and love our friends. Christ is our standard 
All right, it's, it's, it's the thing we look to. How should I pick my friends? How should I love my friends? How should I walk with my friends? Christ modeled it perfectly. And we have that roadmap in our lives. So this week, as, as you wrestle with taking catalog of the people in your life, do you have people, like I said, maybe one, maybe three, who are reliable, who are loyal, who will actually sit down and give you good counsel without putting the pressure on you to be God in their life. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that in your makeup, the triune God, that you model relationships for us. You model the very thing that you want us to desire and pursue and that's relationships with one another. You created us for it. And so I pray as we look at our relationships, as we take inventory of them, that you would allow us to be good friends ourselves. That we'd ultimately look to you in our times of loneliness, which will happen in our, in our times of, of despair at times, in our times of wondering, is there really people out there that can love me and walk with me? May we trust you, that you do have our best interests in mind, that you do have people that we should be loving, that we should be vulnerable with. And Father, at the same time, teach our hearts and minds to protect ourselves as we live in a world that might not love all of who you are, with people that might not be the best influence on our lives, lest we become like them. So, Father, we thank you that we get um, to sit under your word, that we get to worship with you this morning. In your name, amen.